If you can only watch five games in week two of college football, these are the games you do not want to miss. Now, I try not to miss any college football games. And with my personal setup, I have five, six games going on at a time. And my wife be asking, George, how you watch all these games at one time? <laughs> Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Don't worry about it. I'm getting it done. And first up, we got Cal at Auburn. Say what you want about my old college teammate, Justin Wilcox, and his struggles in the Pac-12, but this man always has the Golden Bears ready for non-conference battles. Because since he took over at Berkeley, Wilcox is 5-3 and three against major non-conference opponents, and with all three losses to Auburn in 2023, Notre Dame in 22, and TCU in 21, coming by a combined 13 points. Now, he's beaten Ole Miss twice, North Carolina twice, and BYU on the road. So that means that his team is ready to travel. And I believe that no matter the win or loss in the game, just like last year's 14 to 10 game against Auburn, that Auburn came out the victor, the game is going to be worth watching and it is gonna be absolutely interesting. And one player that I'm really gonna be watching closely is Peyton Thorne, and that's Auburn's quarterback. Because Auburn has a lot of hopes that their fifth year player can elevate his game to make sure that the Tigers are a contender in the SEC. And in order to do that, he'll have to do a lot better than the 94 passing yards that he tallied against Cal last year. But the biggest question about Cal is, are they gonna be able to get their offense going? Because they played two quarterbacks last week against UC Davis, and it actually looked like UC Davis had them on the ropes. But then in the second half, their defense locked down. They were able to get three interceptions and they were able to get their running game going on some level. But the question is, will Jaden Ott be healthy? Because he went out in that UC Davis game and he's the catalyst for that offense. I cannot wait to watch this Tennessee and North Carolina State game in the Duke's Mayo Classic in Charlotte. If it wasn't for the ACC embarrassing themselves in the Clemson, Georgia game, as well as the Virginia Tech Vanderbilt game, the SEC wouldn't even have anything to be proud of so far in the non-conference. But Miami did smash Florida, and the ACC needs NC State to show up against Tennessee to even the score and to even have a chance at non-conference supremacy with Boston College versus Missouri and Ole Miss versus Wake Forest coming up next week on September 14th. I put Nico Iamalava on my Heisman watch list before the season even started. People were trying to put everybody else and they were like, George, why do you have him on there? Because I knew what was going to happen. I saw the kid play out here in California at Warren High School and not having to show up at Tennessee and take over the program immediately was the best thing that could have happened for him. He got a chance to sit back behind Joe Milton and watch and learn. He got a chance to develop. He got comfortable out there in Knoxville, got his, got his footing in the city, footing with the team. He even got a chance to get comfortable with Josh Heupel's offense, and now he's going to get a shot to prove himself against a defense that led the ACC in interceptions in 2023 and was fifth in the conference in total sacks. And this Tennessee team, with the way that their schedule is set up, they have an opportunity for obviously Nico to make a Heisman run, but this is a team that is going to put the fear in Alabama when they get a chance to play. Now on the other side of the ball, Grayson McCall left Coastal Carolina as a four-year starter at quarterback on a team that averaged 25 pass attempts per game. And that landed him with a team that does way more from the pocket than McCall is used to. They had him throw 40 times last week. And that's a lot of time in the pocket for a guy that enjoys moving around, throwing on the run, and especially against a Tennessee defense that finished 2023 ninth in the country in total sacks. And that's what Tennessee wants to do. They want to get after McCall. And after last week, they got to prove that he can stand back there and throw it. And if you're NC State, you got to get him on the move, get him comfortable, get him relaxed because this is a different type of offense for him. This game is going to be a test of legitimacy for both of these programs, for Tennessee and NC State. And whoever comes out of this, I'm riding with for the rest of the year because they are going to have the momentum. And the third game 
I will be absolutely locked into this Iowa State Iowa game. Seriously, I, I'm not joking. I know that you're sitting over here laughing. You're like this offensive explosion. Okay, look, look, that's just rude. Now the Seahawk game is the annual snooze fest between the interstate conference rivals that both score lower than Forrest Gump did on his SATs. Now the over under on this game is currently set at 33 and a half. And believe it or not, four out of the last six meetings would have hit the under. So you're like, how is this game gonna be fun? Cause this gonna be a, the rock fight of all rock fights. So the question is, why are you interested, George? Why does this matter to you? Well, for a few reasons, and not all of them are really kind. Cause you know how the 1972 Dolphins break out champagne every time the last undefeated NFL team goes down? Well, Iowa State is 0 for eternity when it comes to 10 win seasons. I'm not saying I break out the champagne every time they fall short of 10 wins, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't very aware of this statistic at all times. And on the Iowa side, how can you not rubber neck at the car crash that is consistently this team's offense, where Kirk Ferentz let his son run this offense into the ground? Because do you remember when Julia Roberts married Lyle LeVette? Well, Iowa's defense is Julia Roberts in this scenario. And I can't believe that these two units actually share a uniform because on the defensive side, Iowa is incredible. And then on the offensive side, they're incredibly bad. But on the positive side though, for this game, both of these teams have a chance to be very good this year. And at this point, it's not out of the realm of possibility that both of them, dare I say it, could make the college football playoff. I said it because the Big 12 is wide open and Iowa's schedule in the Big 10 makes 11 and 1 a real possibility. And the other thing about this matchup that I can't get over is that Matt Campbell is probably the best coach that Iowa State has ever had, but he's 1 in 6 in this game. Donnie Duncan and uh, Dan McCarney and Paul Rhodes all beat Iowa at least three times before him. But the three combined coaches combined to have as many winning seasons in 23 combined years as Matt Campbell has had in the last seven seasons. Now beating Kurt Ferentz is Matt Campbell's white well, and that has to drive Cyclone fans absolutely nuts. Woo, boy, the Longhorns are heading into Ann Arbor, Michigan for a game that Texas fans believe that they'd see in last year's national championship. And that's before Kalen DeBoer over at Washington, who's now at Alabama, ruined their season the same way that he ruined things for my Ducks. Now, this matchup makes me feel old because the only time Michigan and Texas have ever met was back in the 2005 Rose Bowl when Vince Young led Texas to 17 fourth quarter points and a 38-37 victory over the Wolverines. I remember this game like it was yesterday, but there's not a single player on the field for either team that even has a chance of having a single memory of anything that happened in 2005, much less remember it for being one of the greatest college football games of all time. I guess you gotta put me in a nursing home already cause I'm, uh, cause I'm unk at this point. These are two of the biggest brands in college football going head to head, and it's gotta feel like a battle between Coke and Pepsi. Cause outside of the Texas QB room, there isn't necessarily a lot of star power on either side, but it doesn't matter because the laundry is what will drive the ratings and they are gonna be insane. And if you ball out in this game, you will become a star and a household name. But the question is, can Michigan's Donovan Edwards get back to his sophomore production like he did in last year's national championship game when he absolutely showed out? And can Quinn Ewers, Texas quarterback, have a similar big game performance like he did in Tuscaloosa last year? Or will the distraction of Arch Manning nipping at his heels cause him to stumble? And speaking of distractions, can Sharon Moore, Michigan head coach, keep all the questions about Jim Harbaugh and Connor Stallions at bay so he can keep his team focused on literally what's at hand right in front of them? And can Texas head coach Steve Sarkisian prove that his lone 10-win season last year in his long coaching history is about to become the rule instead of the exception? A lot of questions are going to be answered on the field when these two teams meet on Saturday.
And the game that might have the biggest rating of the entire weekend, it is Colorado at Nebraska. Now these TV networks don't care that you hate Deion Sanders or that you're only tuning in to see if Nebraska can stray further and further from the era of Frank Solich. A view is a view, that's all they care about. And despite the fact that Colorado finished the year one and eight against the Pac-12, and Nebraska just finished the year with their seventh, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but seventh consecutive losing season. I fully expect this game's ratings to be blockbuster and probably the biggest of the weekend. Nebraska is trying to regain relevance by starting last year's number one quarterback recruit, Dylan Riola, as a true freshman. And meanwhile, on the other side, you have Colorado Shadur Sanders. Dude is out there trying to prove that he can be the top pick in next year's NFL draft. Now, the crowd in Lincoln, they're going to be crazy. They sell out even though that they've been losing every single year. And this is going to be the most hostile crowd that Shadur Sanders has ever faced. And if Nebraska doesn't win, they could turn that energy inward on Matt Rule because Nebraska fans want to see a turnaround for this program. And Colorado fans, they want to win and because now that Florida State's not doing well, the Dion the Florida State rumors are going to start. And his kids are going to the NFL. So scary times for everybody. But I cannot wait to see this game. And the winner is going to send themselves on a trajectory that is going to set them up for the rest of the season.